Hi, this is Elia Fishman, and welcome to part two of Cystic Pancreatic Tumors. And um, let's get started, and let's pick up what we left off last time when I mentioned about IPMNs. This is the lesion that is driving everyone crazy, I guess. More common in an older population, but occurs in patients over 40, typically. A key is the fact that pancreatic duct is commonly involved, and uh, we then look at where the lesion comes from compared to the duct. Most of the lesions are side branch IPMNs, and those are the benign ones for the most part. When a lesion is a main duct IPMN, then it has a higher chance of leading to malignancy, and those are the ones typically operated on. And of course, there's a mixed typed main duct and side branch. A main pancreatic duct over 1 cm is suggestive of a main duct IPMN. Truthfully, at Hopkins, anything above 7 to 8, we think about main duct. And of course, the main duct, as I mentioned, has a higher chance of malignancy. Predictors of malignancy in IPMN include lesion size over 3 centimeters, growth over 2 millimeters a year, the presence of mural nodules, thickened septations, particularly enhancing septations, and any clinical symptoms like abdominal pain or unexplained pancreatitis. When you have unexplained pain and pancreatitis, that patient will always end up getting surgery. The key with pannins, and this is from Ralph Rubin, how you go from a normal duct, you talk about precursors, uh, you talk about pannin 1, 2, and 3, and how you end up with carcinoma. And very much, it's kind of thinking about it in terms of the story of colon cancer, that you start off normal, and then as you progress, the progression can lead to malignancy. So what do we look at? Classic IPMN, body of pancreas, 1CM. Classic IPMN, maybe a thin septation, head and neck of pancreas, closer to 2.5 centimeters. Here's the same lesion in coronal view. One of the things that always interested me, the Tanaka criteria says 3CM or OV operate, but that's 3CM on the axial. What about 2.7 axial and 3.5 on coronal? Uh, they never answered that question. Another example here. Now this case shows you very much the difficulty in the sense that this lesion could be an MCN. If this is a 45-year-old female, you have to go with MCN because I don't see the duct dilated. And one of the challenges with IPMN sometimes is could it be something else? And this would be a good example of that. IPMMs are typically solitary, but they can be multiple, as in this case, head, body, tail. And you need to look at all of them. Again, one or two can be simple, classic IPMNs, and then one may have nodularity that you need to worry about. But again, multiple. So seeing one lesion, be careful about satisfaction of search. Keep looking for more lesions. I mentioned about central or main duct IPMN. This is a great example. Markedly dilated pancreatic duct. Remember, many people say one centimeter. We're typically going more than seven to eight millimeters as something we worry about. Now, it's interesting, people have tried very hard to come up with criteria, um, and ACR has had criteria. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is people following and not following the criteria. This article in Press made the point that over 40% of reports followed ACR guidelines. Uh, based on the algorithm, however, our radiologists should have provided a follow-up recommendation almost 60%. So. One of the challenges going forward, as with any guidelines, is to make certain radiologists follow the guidelines. So that becomes very, very important. And again, just think about the lesions. Think about the ones I showed you. Now, if you're uncertain about a lesion, what do you do? You can do follow-up, depending on the family history and risk, six months, every 12 months for a few years. You can do EUS with sampling of the tissue. Or with high suspicion, you could do surgery. Now. It's interesting, this was the recommendation. Uh, JACR published 2010, the ACR recommendations about how we should manage patients with simple cysts smaller than 3 cm can be followed, but attempts should be made to characterize cysts larger than 2 cm. Cysts under 1 cm can be followed, but less frequently. And th this is very good suggestions, but the fact is most people didn't follow these suggestions. As I'll show you, these suggestions, and I did a talk recently just about this topic, were just updated in 2017. Now, what's important also is Hopkins, like Mass General and Sahani, they have their own guidelines about how they evaluate the lesions, 
how they divide them up, and when they follow them. Cystic lesions with more complex features or growth rates greater than 1 cm a year should be followed more closely. Endoscopic EUS with fine needle aspiration can be used preoperatively to assess risk of malignancy. And again, going back to that article, uh, people will use their own criteria at their own institution. And I have to admit it makes sense because at Hopkins, we work it out with our surgeons, our GI docs. We have certain criteria how we manage patients. That is how the radiologist ends up learning how to follow those rules. So again, it is tricky. Um, and the article does make the point that you do need to follow uh, your own institution in many of the scenarios. Now I mentioned there's a revision that is just published by Alec Megabo. What they did is they put things into categories under 1.5, 1 1.5 to 2.5 uh, with main pancreatic duct communication, 1.5 to 2.5 we are uncertain about communication, over 2.5 and a patient over 80. Now one of the things they addressed was for how long you follow patients. Based on current criteria, you just there is no end. And the problem is, if we're saying that an IPMN is at risk for developing a malignancy, that risk really never goes away. The uh, ACR guidelines suggest following for nine to 10 years. But again, um, I promise before the 10 years reach, we'll change the guideline about nine or 10 times as well. It's worthwhile reading, and here's just some of the charts from that article, and I won't go through them, but it does try to make things simple, put lesions in terms of size, whether like here, under age 65, 65 to 79, uh, under 1.5, 1 1.5 to 2.5, uh, main duct communication absent or cannot be determined, here, main duct communication established, here, over 2.5, so I think the point is that there are now guidelines and it makes it easier for you, I think, to follow the guidelines. Alec Megabo does make the point that it's not easy, that there's so much we're learning and we will continue to learn. So it's a challenge coming up with absolute guidelines and thinking those guidelines will last the test of time. They're probably the best we can offer now. So they had five principles. All incidental cysts should be pursued mucinous unless the cyst has definitive features of alternative uh, histology like a uh, serous cyst adenoma. Such presumed cysts should be followed or considered for surgery. We recommend nine to 10 years of follow-up depending on initial size and growth patterns. Cyst size directly directs our follow-up. Again, you could read that on your own because the flow charts apply to a range of cyst sizes Growth may require shifting from one flow chart to another, most commonly when a lesion goes from under 1.5 to 1.5 centimeters. So again, you've got to be paying attention to that. Development of worrisome features or high-risk stigmata, nodularity, septations, enhancement, should lead to EUS or surgery. Again, worrisome features at any size are indeed worrisome and you need to go on to the next step. And of course, it always helps to compare to prior studies and see what exactly is happening. So again, um, it's not a perfect set of criteria, but it's one I think you could live with. And again, you're gonna have to balance it against your own institutions. But I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is you have some set of criteria, which helps the referring physician, helps you, and helps our patients. Now, in fact, at Hopkins, we have a multidisciplinary cyst conference. We discuss the cases, there's a clinic we talk about how we manage patients from main duct IPMN, MCNs, and growth will end up in surgery. We have a chart of how we evaluate these patients. And our results were that sometimes we're more aggressive, but the majority of times we're in fact less aggressive. You can see from these two charts that we do change the management of patients. And in fact, it's about 30% of the time. So one of the challenges even though you would say, gee, we have criteria, everybody should have the same answer, obviously it's not going to be the same answer. And this article by Lennon makes that point, management was increased in 52 patients, management was decreased in 16 patients, including 10 who had their recommendation changed from surgery to surveillance. So again, multidisciplinary conference, we do that for pancreatic cancer, and now we do it for pancreatic cysts. So, Again, it puts everyone in the same room trying to come up 
with the optimal management for the patient. Now, when we look at cystic lesions, and we mentioned this before, there are other lesions that can be somewhat confusing. And let me look at a couple. So one, of course, is a necrotic adenocarcinoma. But, you know, they're never perfectly cyst. There was wall enhancement, the septations, nodularity. And, of course, here there are liver metastasis. I don't think you're going to confuse this with an IPMN. Not a problem. Or this case, it looks cystic, but the walls thicken. There's septations, nodularity. There's compression of the portal vein and SMV. And that also is going to be an adenocarcinoma. So, again, we can have cystic adenocarcinomas, and those were just two very nice examples. Now, I mentioned we can have cystic neuroendocrine tumors. It's interesting, most neuroendocrine tumors are larger, and they're very vascular. Now, sometimes we see neuroendocrine tumors that are not vascular. But you have to think also about cystic lesions. Now, the key thing about cystic neuroendocrine tumors, they typically have a hypervascular halo. Obviously, you can see liver meds. 25% have an association with MAN syndrome. But the big thing, cystic lesions are vascular. Very, very important. So arterial phase is so critical to see that enhancing rim. You may not appreciate that on the venous phase, uh, this article by Shiva Raman, unfortunately, given that the hypervascular components may be less conspicuous on venous phase, these lesions are not infrequently incorrectly diagnosed as IPMNs when only a venous phase is acquired. So you need to be careful. Another example here, cystic lesion tail of pancreas. You can think about an MCN, but the wall's too thick. It's going to come out. So I'm not sure we call this a, a, a neuroendocrine tumor. But we did say this is not a simple cyst. This is not a leave alone MCN. This is coming out. Septations, nodularity make it kind of easy. Another case, looks like a cystic lesion like an IPMN, but when you look closer in 3D, look how you appreciate the enhancing rim. You see an enhancing rim in a pancreatic lesion, it's neuroendocrine tumor to me every single time. Volume rendering is very nice for accentuating the borders and bringing out the visualization in these patients with cystic IPMNs, which you can see here again. Another example, head of pancreas near uncinate, vascular lesion, peripheral enhancement, nicely shown axial and nicely shown coronal. Sometimes the cystic lesions get huge. Look at the size of this one. It's cystic, solid, and necrotic with enhancement. You can think about a gist tumor, perhaps. can look somewhat similar, but cystic neuroendocrine tumors can be very large, can be vascular. Most of the time, they displace but don't invade the vessels. But look how large and cystic and solid this lesion is. So this mixed appearance of cystic and solid is indeed not going to be something that's uncommon. And here's one more example of that. Now, let's look at another tumor, one of my favorites, SPEN, solid and papillary epithelial neoplasm. The thing about this is the age, 20th year old female or less, always female, always young. History, abdominal pain. The good thing is that most of these patients do well with surgery and there's no tumor recurrence. Average size about 5 cm, but you can see lesions from 1 cm to 10 cm. Cystic and solid components are common and calcification is fairly common, but typically in the periphery of the lesion. The lesion is more common in the tail than in the head of the pancreas. And again, the differential diagnosis, sometimes it's hard to distinguish these from cystic neuroendocrine tumors, IPMNs, or MCNs. The thing that usually works in our favor is the patient age. When you tell me the patient's 15 or 20 or 25 and they got a cystic mass, I'm telling you that it's a spend tumor. So again, age is critical. Examples, solid and cystic, young patient, boom. Solid pseudopapillary neoplasms are rare and account for under 2% of exocrine tumors, okay? The correct diagnosis is important because it's low malignant potential and the need to make that diagnosis without uh, making the wrong diagnosis. Sometimes they're challenging. This lesion is off the tail of the pancreas. Solid mass could be a number of things, spend tumor. And again, when you look at it carefully, there really is a solid lesion. There's not much of a cystic component. This one looks cystic, well-defined, sharply marginated. A good thing you commonly see is no dilated pancreatic duct, no dilated common duct. And that was a spend tumor. Look how smooth it is. 
it almost looks to me that it's extra pancreatic. Just a beautiful example. Now I mentioned these lesions can calcify, and when you have calcification like this case, it's often in the periphery of the gland that can calcify. Or in this case, maybe not the full 360 is calcified, but there's a lot of calcification in several different zones. And every once in a while, we see central calcification. Though I will admit I see central, I'm thinking about serous cystadenoma. Another lesion I'll just mention, it's an important lesion. Sometimes we can make the diagnosis. It's a benign lesion that if you know it's there and you knew that's what it was, you could leave it alone. Its symptoms are minimal at best, usually an incidental finding. It can be very large. They're a rare tumor, but it can be very confusing. This article by Arumagon, recent reviews documenting the demographic features of lymphothelial cysts, indicates strong male predominance, variable size throughout the pancreas. Half the lesions present incidentally, while the other half presents with symptoms like nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, weight loss, etc. It's interesting. Um, I think the challenge to me is not to confuse it with an adenocarcinoma. The question is, is this an IPMN? Is it a serous cystadenoma? Particularly, these lesions are often exophytic. One of the challenges from the surgeons is if you operate on lymphopathelial cysts, patients often have impressive postoperative pancreatitis. So if you knew the diagnosis in advance, you could leave the lesion alone. So sometimes we suggest it. We're not always right because sometimes cystic lesions like MCNs or IPMNs can be exophytic. But if I see an exophytic mass, younger patient uh, off the pancreas, I'm thinking, could this be a lymphopathelial cyst? So that's an important diagnosis. Uh, in this article, we spoke about uh, cystic tumors. Prospective diagnosis can be difficult at times. If the lesion is suspected to be extra pancreatic rather than arising from the pancreas itself, think lymphopathelial cyst. And again, from a CT perspective, low attenuation, cystic lesion from the pancreas. Sometimes you can't tell it's from the pancreas. It could be from the spleen or stomach, perhaps. Duplication cyst, mesenteric cyst. Here's a nice example. That's coming off the pancreas, but if I told you it was off the stomach, you would say yes. If I told you it was sitting in the lesser sac, you would say yes. Very nice example there, and you can see it in the coronal view. Another patient, 62, with abdominal pain. And when you look here, you don't see much, but when you look at the other images, you see the lesion in the tail of the pancreas. Now again, right age group, could this be a serous cystadenoma? Yes. Could this be an MCN? Yes. So it can be a very difficult diagnosis to make with uh, being very definitive about it. So I've gone through a number of the cystic pancreatic lesions in these two talks, and hopefully it indeed will help you. We've noted that cystic pancreatic neoplasms present a wide range of pathologic entities. There's considerable overlap in CT imaging appearances. However, we often are able to better understand lesions, particularly in 3D, and now we're looking at some role for cinematic rendering. Uh, multiplanar and 3D are very helpful in what otherwise are very complicated lesions. And many lesions require surgical uh, resection due to uncertainty diagnostically, and that's just going to happen. You know, so I think we can be suggestive, but we can't be definitive. Uh, but again, with experience, I think you can do very, very well. And again, think about age. Uh, we do have an app on pancreatic masses. That app focuses on a number of things, including age and many of the signs of pancreatic masses. It's a good place to look if you want more information. And with that, I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention.